In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In every generation, there's good and bad. I'm sure that if you've spoken to people of earlier generations, they will tell you that their generation is the best, and that everything beyond that is really bad and corrupted and meaningless and artificial. The unfortunate thing is that every generation says the same thing about the generation after it. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of what we know, what we feel. And within that context of looking at what's good and what's bad, what we have, what we don't have, is looking for signs. Signs of what things stand for, what they mean, what they represent. Our generation at the moment, when I say our, there's quite a diversity here, I mean we who are alive now, um, have a, a very particular way of, of looking at things. And that is that we want proof. Because it's, it's, it's easy to get proof these days. You know, Google is our friend. Uh, Wikipedia. Uh, a, a search of any kind. Even those strange things that no one uses anymore called libraries. Where there are those objects that you open up like that and you read called books. And they're there. They're around. And so you want proof. We want signs, we want certainty. That's fine in a certain context. But when it applies to our faith, it becomes really problematic. Because what we do sometimes is we look for the signs and forget what we're actually seeking. It becomes about the signs. So, our Lord in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verse 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except a sign of the prophet Jonah. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And we do seek after those signs. But why did they want the sign? Our relationship with God has to have a certain context. And that is that it's based on a continuous interaction, not a single interaction. But if we look at how we interact with God, Generally in our lives, it's a challenge not to make it just individual, separate interactions. And it comes when we need something, whether it's uh, support, uh, an answer, a resolution, comfort, reassurance, lots of things that we need. When I want something, and it's a, it's a sign of my faith that I actually go to God and pray when I need something. It's a recognition, it's an admission that Lord, you can give it to me. Or at least I should ask you and you can provide it. And that's the first thing I want to say. We sometimes feel guilty about praying at times of need. We sometimes feel guilty about going to God when we need something from Him. But actually, that's a beautiful thing. It's a desperate thing, but it's a beautiful thing. From my perspective, I might say, well, I'm just going because I need Him. Because I abuse the relationship. But if I look from God's perspective, what does it mean? It means you're coming to me because you think I can help you. I'll give you an example. I, as someone who's been in pastoral ministry for many years, I, I've dealt with endless numbers of people. And there are some people you deal with regularly, on a regular basis, and you're in their lives. 
And there are others who will be with you and then disappear and then come back and disappear and come back. It never offends me that people disappear and come back. I'd rather them not disappear. I mean, I'd rather them stay and, and, and be, be stable in their relationship. But even when they do disappear and they come back, it doesn't offend me because what it means to me personally is this person still realizes I am his or her father and they realize that I can and will help them. And that's the way I look at it. And that's me, who is human, imperfect, sinful, gets it wrong quite often. That's just me as human. How much more would God be? When we come to Him and we say to Him, Lord, you know what, I need help. He doesn't mind, he actually likes it. Our Lord actually says to us, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest, come to me. But in coming to him, only in these instantaneous situations, we miss out on the relationship. We're missing out. Because imagine if this supreme, infinite, beautiful being who comes into our lives at times when we need him and fixes things for us or supports us, if he was there for the whole time, how much more wonderful would that be? So yes, I'd get the instantaneous solutions, but between those blips, I'd have a line, a continuous line of relationship. And that is a beautiful thing we're aiming for. When we look just for signs, we look for those blips. And that's where the problem is. Why was it called a wicked and adulterous generation? Because it didn't have a continuity of relationship. It had just sporadic, momentary, blip relationship. What God wants of us is a continuous relationship. And again, as I always say to you, it's not because He needs anything from us, because we, we have nothing to give Him. All we give God is heartache and trouble. Until we're actually with Him, then we give Him joy because He's reunited with us. See, God feels pain when we're away from Him. And if we try to measure the time we're away and the time we're with Him, and of course it's going to be different for all of us, the longer we are with Him, the more we bring Him joy. The more His heart is glad because we're, we are safe in His presence. So, during this evening, I want us to focus on something that's immensely important. And that is, let's not look for the signs, and let's look for the relationship. It's the difference between having a good friend, and all you look for in this friend is signs, moments of his or her commitment to you and his or her doing things for you. Prove that you love me. Prove that you care. Prove that I'm important. Prove that I'm a priority. And all that happens in this relationship is a series of points in which we're looking for proof. But if that's the case, we miss out on the actual relationship. We miss out on the love this person gives us. We miss out on the good times. We miss out on the comfort. Likewise in our relationship with God, in the same way, we look for those signs. God, reassure me. Do you really love me? No, you don't love me because you weren't with me today and I didn't pass that exam or didn't get that job or I didn't find this person. No, you didn't love me. But I, apparently I loved you yesterday when I did what you wanted. Yeah, but yesterday was yesterday. 
What about today? You don't love me today, but hang on. I am unchangeable, unchanging. Why would I change from yesterday to today? If you're convinced that I loved you yesterday, then why and how would I not love you today? And so we spend so much time just on the proof side of things that we lose the relationship itself. One of the most beautiful things about Christianity, as opposed to any other faith, is that it is built on a God with whom we can relate and have a relationship. He's not just a deity who judges us. He's not just a deity who created us. He is God, our creator, our savior, our judge, but he is the one who says, come to me, and with whom we can interact daily. He wants us to, to the extent that God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but will have everlasting life. He came into this world to give us everlasting life. He didn't come here to be a king over us, because you know what? He was already a king over us. He didn't come here to be our judge, because he was already our judge. He didn't come here to play creator, because he was already creator. He came to engage with us. And to say, it's not just about the moment that I created you, and then the moment that I judge you, but in the middle of those, there's a relationship. In the middle of those, I want to see you. I want to feel you. I want to be with you. I want you to understand me. I want you to know who I am and why I am. Why I am? Because I'm your father. Why I am? Because I'm your savior. And I wait for you. There's a little glitch with wanting to know precisely when things are going to happen, especially the second coming. If you're anything like me, you are probably a last minute crammer. Whether it's exams, or job interviews, or anything else you do. We put things, oh this is only, it's a year away, it's six months away, it's a month away, it's two weeks away, it's tomorrow morning. And we don't realize it. One of the benefits of knowing time is you can plan it down to the minute. So you'll say, technically it would be great for me to study for a whole six months. But actually, all I need is five hours. So rather than starting to study six months ago, I'm going to study those five hours the night before my exam. And so I can plan it that way. I can go down by the skin of my teeth and I can pick the time I start. That's great. And that's the kind of principle we're trying to apply in our lives. Lord, if I knew when you were coming, I'll be ready. But listen, <laughs> that's not the point. You're not going to be on your best behavior to be ready. You're on your best behavior because that's how you should be. There's this thing in, um, in Egypt, and I've, actually, I've also seen it here sometimes in many other countries, where if the president is ever going to go visit an area, right, it could be the poorest, most run-down area ever. What you end up doing is finding the repair crews out on the roads, fixing the roads, patching up potholes, painting things, cleaning things. Why? Because he's going through there. It may not have been done for 
five years, ten years, but the fact that he's going through on that day means I get it cleaned up on that day. Just like if you have a visitor coming to your house. You'll get it all cleaned up because the person's coming. And that's how we approach our spiritual lives. God's coming, the second coming is tomorrow, I've got to get myself clean, ready. It's not about just getting yourself ready because he's coming. It's about getting yourself ready because that's how you should be. There should be no potholes in the road whether the president is coming or not. There should be no litter whether the president is coming or not. You should be ready and prepared and clean and empowered whether God is coming to go tomorrow or not. Because it's about the life we live and how we live it. So the glitch, as our Lord tells us in Matthew 24, 36, he says, but of that day and hour no one knows. No one knows. And you think, Lord, do you really mean no one? Surely there's someone on the inside. You know, like the prophets who have come up over the past 2,000 years and they keep telling us that the end is coming next week. They even give us dates and times. They tell us, it's it. The world is done. Prepare. And God says, actually, no. No one. But Lord, are you sure? You haven't sort of whispered into someone's ear. You haven't given someone inside information. You know, we all have favorites, so I'm sure you have favorites. He says, no one. To the extent that he goes on, he says, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It is only God who knows when that time is coming. And so to look for signs is to look for false information. But the thing about false information is sometimes we like it anyway. Why not? Deep inside, I know that the scriptures tell me that no one knows, not even the angels. But you know, if someone's going to say to me it's going to be in two weeks' time, I can live it up now. And then two weeks minus half a day, I'll get my act together. I'll get cleaned up. Everything will be fine. Then I'll wait. Only to be disappointed. Nah, sorry. Not the right time. And we keep losing those opportunities. We keep worrying about things that we can't change. We keep worrying about when the end is going to be. And our Lord again in Matthew 6, 27 says to us, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? You worry about the end of times. What does it do for you? How does it help you? Don't worry. Because worrying doesn't change anything. Rather than worry, because worry takes energy, takes time. You know, if you've got something on your mind and you're worried about it, it takes time and focus and energy and it gives you anxiety. Just spoke to someone recently, just yesterday, who couldn't log on to a work email. And we all know what that means. Tried to log on to her email and she couldn't get on. And so I got a frantic phone call. Do you think I've been fired? But I didn't do anything. I told them I had a day off, but I couldn't go. Well, what happened? Who's going to do this? What's going to happen? And went to his friends. Yes, just wait. Just, just wait. Don't, just don't worry. Don't worry about that. It turned out this morning that it was just a glitch in the system and everything was absolutely fine. We do that all the time. We do that all the time. And we take up precious time that should be used to build and strengthen and maintain and deepen a relationship with God, we take that and we consume it in worry. It's, it's very much like having a steam engine that's over here that needs coal 
so it keeps going. But you know what? Rather than putting the coal in this steam engine so it can take me forward, let me just light a fire here outside. Let's just, let's just build a nice fire and let's blaze it out here and waste all this energy. But my steam engine is still sitting here, immovable. We only have a limited amount of energy. Are we going to burn it here or are we going to burn it here? One is purposeful, positive, building, directed. The other is just a waste of energy. All it creates is black smoke and then just evaporates and nothing comes of it. You remember the account of our Lord being in Bethany and Mary sitting at his feet and Martha worrying, buzzing around the house, comes up to him and says, Lord, this sister of mine, you know, your favorite, she's sitting there, she's left me, look what's going on. Don't you think you should help me? What did our Lord say to her? He said, no, Martha, you're wrong to work. He didn't say that. No, Martha, you're wrong to be dedicated. He didn't say that. No, no, Martha, you should just forget about people. He didn't say that either. He said to her, her problem was that she worried about many things. She was consumed. She was distracted. That's what we need to avoid. That distraction is like lighting your coal out here in this vacant place rather than making use of it to move forward. But we always look for signs because that's how the world around us is. In the book of Jeremiah, God warns his people. And he says, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them. This world looks for certain signs and ignores others. We look for the signs that please us, that go along with what we want, that coincide with everything we stand for. And the other signs, we don't. So who's going to choose? So therefore, if we're going to be so distracted by those signs, let's forget about signs altogether. And then let's live life. Let's just live the life we're supposed to live. I was reminded today that at our last meeting, and probably for the last few sermons, I've been focused on the theme that's been really important to me. And that is that God wants us to enjoy our lives. Believe it or not, and as opposed to everything that people who are against the principle of God, principle of God, teach us. God is not this vindictive creature who puts us in a cage and watches us for his own entertainment. We're not supposed to be here caged with a series of hamster wheels and slides and, and bits and pieces and we distract ourselves and we take food from here and we store it there and we go around the hamster wheel and we go up the ladder and down the slides and we hang in the air and all that sort of things and he's just looking on entertained. That's not how God deals with us. That's not why God is in our lives. God has put us into this world, into this life to actually enjoy it. Now, of course, the meaning of an enjoyment is going to vary from one person to the next. 
For some people to enjoy is to enjoy the very material, secular, carnal things of this world. But that's not all that is in this world. Because there are many, many others who enjoy the godly, sacred and spiritual. You're here for that. You're here because that's what you want. That's what's important to you. And as much as we would like to think about it, and I'm sorry to tell you, we are not the only righteous people in the world. There are many, many, many millions of people in this country, in these nations, around the world, who are also seeking God. We're not as much of a rarity as some would like us to think. Yes, it's more challenging, but we're not a dying breed. Of course it's more challenging, because we have to work harder. It's like, it's like walking along this path, or walking through water. Sometimes life is just like walking on this path. It's simple, it's minimal resistance. But then sometimes it's like walking through water where it, there's more resistance. But those of you who may have had a sports injury or anything like that will know that in itself is not a bad thing. Because when you're walking through water, or although there is greater resistance, it actually helps you build your muscles. It gives you more tone and more strength. Just going through the motions of walking through that water makes you stronger. And that's just how our lives are sometimes. It's like walking through that water where it becomes a bit of a struggle, it becomes a little bit more difficult. But in actual fact, we can still do it and we become stronger for it. Proverb 12.25 says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. All right? And of course, depression here is not the clinical depression we're talking about. To, to, what, is, what is depression? It's that, that feeling organically that's what it does when we feel anxious. It tightens my heart, it tightens my, my mind, it tightens my thoughts. It makes me think and feel in a certain direction and it restricts me from many others. But the good word makes it glad. The good word of God, the good word of hope, the good word of life. I know you'll feel that as Christians, and I don't know if anyone's gone through this, but I think it's, it's probably proven that the times when we feel worst are sometimes when the times we're furthest away from him. Because if he is the life we live, the light we have, the air we breathe, then being away from him means we are deprived of those life-giving things. And that's why it feels different. That's why it feels different when he just seems to not be there. In the actual fact, it's not that he is not there, it's that we're not there. Because we're looking for other things. So, what does today show us? I hope that we leave here today with a certain renewed understanding. 
it's not about signs. Signs are great, but that shouldn't be your focus. Signs might be a general guide, but they shouldn't be our only aim. The aim is to always be ready, always be prepared, in season and out of season. Our Lord says to us that we should be ready so that when the master of the house comes, we are there to greet him. To be ready so that if the thief comes, we can stand before him and stop him. We should be ready that whenever our heavenly bridegroom comes, that we as his earthly bride are ready to join him in that wonderful festival, that everlasting joy, and that bond that once it is sealed, no one can ever take away or break. And glory be to God forever. Amen.